So if I um, if I recall correctly, uh, the title that I, I gave um, for the talk today uh, was about how to make your technology uh, anti racist. Um, and I provided that title, uh, number one, because it's in line with um, where I've been doing a lot of thinking and and where a lot of folks, frankly, have been uh, pushing me quite a bit. And so I'll step back for just a second and talk a little bit about the book Black Software, which uh, Michael mentioned, um, which was an endeavor for me that was uh, tremendously uh, insightful. Uh, I should say by way of background, uh, I am not a uh, technologist. Much of my career has been focused on issues of race and politics in uh, sort of the electoral uh, frameworks and context. And so about 10 years or so ago, I started to do work uh, in this area of race and technology more, uh, more specifically. Um, and that was motivated by a lot of things. It was motivated by uh, the fact that my primary interest around race and equity and racial justice um, in the political work and political communication work that I was doing started to really migrate into online contexts um, more and more. And so the people that I was working with, the folks that I was interested in collaborating with uh, were in online spaces were using digital tools. And so over a period of time, I started to become much more interested in uh, what it was about the technology that really fueled uh, some other aspects of uh, collaboration and community building that uh, folks I was working with were, uh, were interested in. And then uh, 2014 came, uh, and some of you will be familiar with uh, the moment uh, uh, where we saw uh, the events of Ferguson, Missouri, uh, saw the rise of Black Lives Matter movement, um, and all of these new kinds of movements with respect to racial justice uh, really uh, getting on, underway and catapulting issues of racial justice to uh, the fore in the way that they hadn't been uh, on the public agenda in the US context uh, for quite some time, uh, many, many decades, uh, in fact. And so this got me really interested, again, um, curious about the affordances of digital media technology and its influence in enabling Black Lives Matter activists to be able to do and accomplish what it was that they accomplished, which I think was uh, hugely um, impactful um, and significant. And so, uh, you know, I remember at the um, uh, very beginnings of some of that research and talking to uh, activists and these uh, movements and so forth who, um, you know, would push back often when I would talk about the uh, sort of technological affordances that really pushed and magnified their work. Uh, and folks who would really push back to say, look, um, you know, the work is the work um, and technology is really something uh, off to the side. And so they would resist this notion of thinking about something like Black Lives Matter as a, a digital movement or uh, some aspect of what we might call digital uh, activism. And so I started to become interested more and more in uh, simply this juxtaposition of race and racial justice and technology. And so that's where the uh, impetus for uh, the book Black Software came from. And when I started that book, it was um, it was going to be a fairly short book in that I thought I knew what it was I was interested in writing about and researching. Um, and I had in my mind that, uh, uh, of course, something like a Black Lives Matter uh, and similar movements don't emerge from nowhere, particularly those that are impactful in the way that this uh, this was. Um, and so as I started to look for the kind of digital footprints or the uh, technological origins of Black Lives Matter and similar types of racial justice movements, uh, I figured that story for me was going to end uh, somewhere in uh, the late or uh, mid 1990s, sometime where we had the origins of uh, the web as we, uh, as we know it. And what I began to discover and unravel was a set of stories that really um, pushed the limits of what I had come to know about 
uh, the relationship between uh, race and particularly between African Americans and computing technology. Uh, and in particular, all of the literature up to that time, um, as I had begun to research and started to write, uh, had said that the, uh, the relationship between race and civil rights in particular and technology, um, that these were sort of two parallel stories, um, that they both as uh, kind of new revolutions in a way uh, occupied uh, the same starting point uh, in terms of their origins, more or less, um, but they were seen as two parallel um, movements happening on very different tracks with very little interaction uh, between the two, and so not much on uh, in the way of technology and uh, uh, technologists and folks that were uh, influential or interacting with what was going on in the civil rights movement at the time in the uh, late 50s, early 60s and beyond, uh, and very few the other way uh, around civil rights activists and uh, leaders and so forth who were engaged in the growing uh, technological enterprises, computing technology enterprises that were uh, emerging uh, at that period of time. And so the thing that I began to find was that with my research and as I began to talk with people in that more recent history of uh, the 2000s and the 90s and so forth was uh, that my timeline started to get further and further and further back in history. Um, and doing so then pushed me uh, to unravel and to really uncover what I thought was uh, at least for me, a very different and revolutionary uh, story about the relationship between race and computing technology uh, that I had no prior knowledge uh, of, um, but that uh, struck me as very significant when we think today about the relationship between race, racial justice, and uh, technology, particularly for the prospect of thinking about how we might use technology to uh, bring about more equitable, more just, more racially uh, just um, communities, a world, et cetera. And so as I've been talking about uh, the book to various audiences, in particular when I began to talk um, a lot with um, uh, computer scientists, folks uh, in technical communities, technologists of one stripe or another, I always started to get this question about, all right, if our past is what it is and has been, how do we think about change? How do we think about the process of doing things differently from the standpoint of uh, both the imagination of technology and new technological tools to their design, to their uh, build and to their proliferation out into um, uh, use in, in various environments. So what uh, does anti-racist technology look like? And so I had originally thought that that's what I would talk about today and had been prepared to, um, to do so. To, to address that particular question about how to make technology anti-racist or how to think about technology in an anti-racist framework, of course, uh, requires us to think about some other questions that um, pop up from time to time in conversation uh, that I find are both um, interesting on the one hand, uh, for other folks it tends to be uh, a barrier in terms of really coming to grips with terminology or concepts when we try to think about this relationship between technology and race and racial justice. And so can computing technology uh, be racist is often a question, particularly if we start from the standpoint of how to make technology anti-racist, which presumes that uh, technology is racist. And so can computing technology be racist, whether we're talking about software or hardware or algorithms, where we're talking about uh, digital platforms, the internet, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, various forms of machine learning applications, um, all of these questions animate our current uh, conversations, both in a way that uh, tries to, I think, connect our history, our present, and really in a lot of ways, our future in terms of the ways and the 
influence that technology might have uh, on our ability to uh, create a world, uh, a society that we think is uh, much more just and uh, in line with what it is that we desire. So how to make your technology anti-racist and then these questions about uh, can computing technology be racist? And if so, what does that look like? And so I decided that what I would spend most of my time talking about today is this final um, question about how our computing technology became racist, because I think that's where a lot of confusion comes into play. We all have varying def definitions about what racism is, what constitutes being um, racist, some of, of which I think is productive, some not, but often it becomes the thing we have to push through and confront to be able to get to the other side of being able to think about anti-racist tech. So for the next few minutes, that's what I wanna focus on and talk about a little bit of what we might call an origin story of racist technology or the anatomy of racist technology or thinking about the structure of uh, racist tech or technology infrastructure as I uh, often describe it. So let me <clears throat> see if I can push the right button to get to my next slide here. There we go. So let me start with just a brief definition. Um, and often this is where things, uh, conversations on this topic sort of go off the rails because people have very differing conceptions of and definitions of what racism uh, is. So for me, racism has a very specific um, and somewhat narrow set of definitions. Uh, and that's seeing in that sort of middle um, uh, section here that racism for me is by definition always structural, it's systemic. Um, and because it is structural and systemic, it is uh, uh, processes, structures, systems that produce advantage and disadvantage along racial lines. So that's my simple way, simplified uh, definition of racism. Um, these uh, uh, advantage and dis disadvantages uh, might accrue and the systems that promote them might uh, do so either intentionally and by design. Um, and we'll talk about some of uh, perhaps examples of that uh, today. Uh, the other aspect of what you know, I think probably most often is the case and uh, part of our experience today is that uh, we see these in varying forms of disparate outcomes and those disparate outcomes being again aligned along uh, racial uh, differences. Um, and so this is simply my framework for thinking about racism um, and then informs what I think of as uh, racist technology or the answer to the question, can technology be racist? And if you haven't already um, uh, figured out, my answer to that question is yes. Um, and so I wanna proceed in telling you uh, sort of why I see it that way. And I wanna take us through a story of um, history. Um, and so I wanna begin here. There's a lot in this slide and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time um, here. And what I've tried to do is both to piece together a story, but also a kind of architecture, if you will, um, or structure or the beginnings of what come to be both um, our technological infrastructure from the early 1960s and building up to our current day, but also then its connection with uh, this singular area around race and uh, several of its manifestations. So let's begin um, in uh, about 1965. Um, and certainly there are some earlier starting points that I could begin with, but I think this is a good one because um, it is focused on where I think um, the origin point, if we will, the beginnings of um, how technologies become racist begin. And that to me happens around and in connection to problems. And so I wanna think about for just a few minutes about problems and the problem that uh, the US as a country was focused on 
uh, in the early and mid 1960s at the same time in which uh, many other things are going on uh, in this country, particularly with respect to uh, race and civil rights. And so in a little bit of a, a chronological order here, um, in March of 1965, uh, Lyndon Johnson, then President Lyndon Johnson, uh, gave what was, uh, for many folks, his most uh, famous speech. It was a speech uh, primarily about civil rights, and he made this particular statement where he said, there is no Negro problem, there is no Southern problem, there is no Northern problem. There is only an American problem, and we are met here tonight as Americans to solve that problem. So a couple of things I want to draw your attention to, which is, on the one hand, um, Johnson's speech here was really about civil rights. It was really about looking forward to a number of civil rights uh, legislation and initiatives that he was hoping to uh, build support for. Uh, and so from his standing, uh, his standpoint in this speech and talking about race and problems and talking about the Negro problem, uh, as it were at that time, was all in um, line with what he saw as steps towards um, more and greater civil rights. But within that, I think it is um, uh, imperative for us to point out that uh, that being what it was and is still means that at that particular time in the 1960s, the primary problem facing the country, the most important problem on many people's minds in the public arena, in the uh, public sector, uh, in terms of those in government and places of uh, uh, policy and power was race and particularly what was happening on the streets across the nation, which was the outpouring of uh, protests and other forms of uh, civil unrest and civil disobedience that was playing out from uh, Black folks and uh, other allies who were fighting for civil rights. So Johnson makes this statement in, um, in March of that year. Earlier in that same time frame, uh, part of Johnson's constituency is trying to convince him that um, the primary problem that really faces the country is a question or a problem of crime. And long story short, that these two things, uh, our race problem or Negro problem and the crime problem, uh, ends up being juxtaposed or being essentially one and the same, I should say. Um, and so our crime problem, which Johnson, interestingly enough, uh, did not think was a problem of national magnitude um, as far as he uh, uh, you know, saw and was looking out on all of the, um, uh, the imperatives of the time and the uh, priorities of the nation, crime was not at the top of his list, but many of his constituency and primarily white constituency who was pushing him to say, look what's going on. Crime is rampant. That crime problem was often uh, focused uh, in the usual places and with the usual suspects in urban uh, ghettos in large cities uh, that were uh, primarily occupied by uh, Black folks and uh, particularly those that were uh, poor, but not exclusively so. <clears throat> And so in 1965, the summer of 1965, Johnson um, calls into being the Commission on Crime and the Administration of Justice. Um, so this is July of 1965, the latter part of July that this task force uh, gets called into being and it has a very wide mandate, which is simply to inquire into the causes of crime. Why do people commit crime? And how can we go about as a nation best uh, solving the problem of crime and ensuring that people have no reason to and certainly uh, that there is a, uh, a justifiable remedy to those who do commit crime. And so again, this comes into being in July. 
about two weeks later, uh, we have um, what was probably one of the most well-known and largest at the time uh, of these, um, uh, these protests in Watts that erupted uh, the streets of South Central Los Angeles in August 1965. Um, this was in Watts a situation that came about um, much like uh, the things that we've been seeing on the streets of uh, this country over the last uh, few weeks and uh, years, which was a community that was uh, highly uh, segregated, that was primarily black and that had been battling for years against treatment and brutality by uh, the LAPD by police officers and the law enforcement community in Los Angeles uh, that erupted uh, that uh, day in August 1965. Uh, National Guard troops uh, by the tens of thousands were called in. At the end of the day, 35 or 40 African-Americans were uh, killed, were dead. Many thousands others were arrested and jailed. Um, and this became probably the, uh, the most prominent visible spectacle about uh, the Black civil rights struggle that the nation had begun to see and what they saw and how they interpreted it uh, in large part because of their own perceptions, but also because of uh, the media's framing of it at the time, they saw Black lawlessness, they saw Black criminality uh, run amok and on display in this particular moment. So as the, uh, the president's commission gets started on their task of trying to understand the so-called crime problem, we start to see a crystallization of what uh, not only the public, but the law enforcement community and uh, those in uh, public policy arenas are starting to see as the face of the nation's crime problem, which was black, which was urban, which was largely poor. And so this becomes the problem that the nation has to solve at this point in time in 1965. The other part of this story, and this is interesting that um, I'm sure that uh, this was always going to be part of the commission, uh, but certainly uh, gained new traction in the aftermath of Watts when uh, the commission uh, tasked uh, its crown jewel. Um, and so let me step back to say that the crime commission was made up of several uh, task forces, each of which were directed to very different sectors of trying to understand and tackle the uh, crime problem. And so you see those listed here, uh, some of those task forces that were focused primarily on policing, some on the courts, juvenile, juvenile justice, organized crime, and some, particularly those in the social and behavioral uh, uh, sciences and so forth, focusing on the, uh, the determinants of crime and trying to understand why people get involved in crime in the first place. But for Johnson and for his attorney general, um, uh, Nicholas Katzenbach, the Science and Technology Task Force was the crown jewel of this commission. And essentially, this is what uh, gave this group an imperative from Johnson, from Katzenbach. Um, and it is seen in this comment uh, here um, that, AG, uh, uh, that uh, Katzenbach makes in the final report of the commission, but this was also part of uh, the sort of marching orders for this task force uh, at the beginning. And they laid out this justification saying that more than 200,000 scientists and engineers are helping to solve military problems, but only a handful are helping to control the crime uh, or control the crimes that injure or frighten millions of Americans each year. And so essentially what happens is Johnson looks around and says, look, we've seen and we are in, in the midst of this new uh, computing revolution, a revolution that has already uh, showed its value in, uh, in terms of war, in terms of space. Um, and so how can we mobilize this new technological power to help us solve our crime problem? 
again, a crime problem that is very much personified in uh, the faces and communities uh, primarily of uh, African Americans. And so here, you know, I want to spend a little bit more time trying to sort of focus and emphasize that um, if we might say that there is a starting point, as it were, in terms of how technology becomes racist, then in my mind, this is at least an example of when that happens. That is, when you have a racialized problem, and particularly a racialized problem for which the people themselves are identified as and framed as the problem that must be solved. So when you have that problem that is then juxtaposed uh, with a technological imperative, that is a call for new technology to help solve a problem that is a problem primarily about uh, human beings and done so in a way in which the problem and the people who personify it are uh, objects in this relationship, not participants in um, uh, a relationship in which technology is going to be used to try to help ameliorate and address uh, this particular problem. And so in the same way that technologies that helped us on the battlefield, places like Watts um, and other places across the US uh, that erupted in the same ways throughout 65, 66, 67, the period of time that this commission is doing um, its work was very much framed in the same way as a battlefield um, primarily made up of lawless uh, people uh, who were black, who were poor and who needed to be um, solved in some way, who needed to be policed. And so the technology task force in many ways was called into being to help um, address this problem, to shed light on new ideas um, and things that we could do forward looking from that uh, point in time into the future to help make sure that we solve this crime problem. And so one thing I'll do before uh, continuing is simply sort of identifying, and I mentioned that uh, all of these columns on the left, which are the different task forces that made up the commission, though these were independent task forces, what we end up seeing though that, though they don't sort of follow from the science and technology task force as is sort of laid out here, all of the recommendations that end up coming up in each of these separate task forces in some way end up funneling back through the science and technology task force, meaning that technology was the broadest framework for how it was the commission uh, thought about uh, this new national task and imperative about trying to solve crime, that our greatest ability and our greatest power to be able to address and solve this problem was going to be through our technology. And so not only were the recommendations of the Science and Technology Task Force, uh, which we'll see here in a, a second, uh, not only did those play a role, but all the other recommendations for each of these other uh, segments were filtered through this prism of um, how do we then marshal computing technology to do or to um, uh, operationalize what has been recommended in each of these uh, task forces. Here we can see, um, we can just sort of scroll through a bit and I'll give you a second to just kind of look through. These were some of the uh, recommendations from the Science and Technology Task Force uh, in particular. Um, and it's interesting that that task force uh, in terms of its makeup and in terms of what it was that they uh, did as a body. Um, it's interesting, or at least it was very interesting to me that uh, number one, that you had sort of uh, three groups represented on that task force. Uh, so you mostly had uh, folks from the scientific uh, com community, um, particularly from the uh, uh, computing uh, world. And so uh, you had folks uh, who were very much technologists, who were at the cutting edge, uh, mathematicians, 
uh, operations researchers, uh, folks that were very much in the mindset of trying to really uh, model um, and uh, sort of model behavior in terms of crime and thinking about computational uh, solutions uh, in varying ways. Um, and so you have technologists, uh, scientists that are making up part of the body of this uh, uh, task force. Uh, the others are also um, uh, less technologists, but part of the, the private sector, uh, and particularly uh, in this case with, um, with IBM. Um, and interestingly, IBM, who made uh, or who was represented in a, a large way on this uh, uh, task force, um, both from a technological standpoint as well as from a marketing standpoint. And so several folks on the science and technology task force were IBM marketing personnel. And again, that goes back to this uh this idea about problems and the centrality of problems and its connection to technology um, this was one of the ways in which of course ibm marketed itself at that time which was uh, a company that uh, solved problems and that marshaled computing technology to solve problems and so their point of view was doesn't matter if it's in criminal justice or in banking or in logistics or transportation, you give me your problem, we will build and customize a technological solution for you. Um, and so interesting to see that represented uh, in the work of this committee that largely um, then uh, did a, a number of experiments, simulations, et cetera, to not only try to understand um, and come up with ideas for new technologies that could help in this space, but to uh, give the, uh, the policy community, to give uh, the president a model for what could be, for what could be a new uh, technological enterprise, a new technological infrastructure that could help undergird, support, and further the mission of helping to address and solve uh, crime problems. Um, so hopefully you've been able to see some of these on this list. I won't point some of them out given that uh, time is already uh, running uh, quickly. Uh, but this gives you an, an idea of some of the computational solutions uh, that were uh, and came out of this particular task force. The next step in the process that I will point out is the end result of um, the task force, which many of the re recommendations that were made uh, both by the science and technology community as well as, or the task force as well as all those other uh, task forces that I mentioned, uh, found their way in a new, very large, very expansive legislative package called the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. Um, to put a long story short, if you think about modern policing today, if you think about our technological infrastructure, our social and political infrastructure around law enforcement and policing, all of it, have, all of it has its origins um, back to this um, very significant legislation that comes out of the task force in 1968. One of the recommendations, of course, that came from the Science and Technology Task Force was that a new agency be created uh, that would essentially be a massive research and development arm of thinking about uh, technology in the service of law enforcement. Uh, and that was enacted through what was called the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration that was created through this legislation uh, in 1968. Uh, and what this um, uh, office did essentially was provide the uh, funding and other forms of support uh, to build new technological systems in the service of law enforcement. And so you'll see a number of uh, uh, projects that come up from uh, very early stages, um, projects that were getting underway, some of which were uh, even coming to completion already by 1970. These come through in the first report uh, of the LEAA in 1970. So 
project search, for instance, the system uh, for electronic, electronic analysis of retrieval of, of criminal histories, um, Project Trace, a system that uh, looked to optimize um, uh, data to try to understand which cases to uh, adjudicate at what time, um, Tactical Police Information Systems, uh, which was another massive uh, data system uh, that would help to uh, both search criminal histories uh, across the U.S. through increasingly connected uh, databases, as well as to be able to um, identify target and uh, um, uh, bring uh, information to the fore to the law enforcement community uh, through these other uh, identification markers, fingerprints, mug shots, etc. Uh, the Maryland Interagency Law Enforcement Computer System. Uh, uh, and then others to tin pen, uh, et cetera. These all just give you a flavor of um, what this new computational law enforcement infrastructure was starting to look like, uh, which really focused a lot on uh, data collection, being able to have places to store data, being able to have the ability to, uh, at uh, one's fingertip, to retrieve data about um, criminal acts about arrest, about crimes that had been committed and the people who committed them. And then increasingly uh, to not only have those independent systems, but then to uh, network those systems. And so you start to see uh, networking that's going on from these uh, systems. Sometimes they start with a group of states uh, connected to something like a project search. Uh, and then those states going from five states to 15 to 20, uh, and then a number of, uh, of uh, connections and networks between uh, these systems and the National uh, Criminal Justice or Criminal Justice Database by the FBI, all of which provides the, uh, the opportunity to link data across the United States for the retrieval of uh, criminal data about particular um, uh, perpetrators or suspects of crime. Uh, and I'm going to try to run through this because I do want to leave some uh, time for uh, questions. Here's just another picture of what begins to proliferate in 1968 and beyond. And so this is the, uh, the first report of, of uh, what was called criminal justice uh, information systems came to be called uh, these systems looked uh, different in some way, but all of which uh, focused on uh, this data repository that was used to advance a number of uh, police and law enforcement uh, capabilities. Uh, and so this gives you a, a sense of where these things were popping up, and they were across every state in uh, the U.S. as well as U.S. territories. Uh, you can see that these were systems that were focused on various uh, aspects of law enforcement uh, from tracking crimes and arrest um, to uh, uh, reporting on uh, cases as they move through the courts and correction system, uh, things that focus on behavioral aspects of uh, prisons and jails and the prospects of uh, rehabilitation. Um, and then other aspects um, of this. This is a different uh, view. These are all the variables uh, at the top of uh, top row of that prior slide. And you can start to see a little bit more depth into what was being taken into account about the systems that were being um, built uh, on everything from their funding uh, and how much money they were uh, getting from uh, the law enforcement uh, 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 grants uh, from the new agency, uh, the contractors who's going into service to help build these uh, systems, um, all the different uh, uh, companies like IBM or other tech companies that are uh, part of doing this. And then you can start to see the varying law enforcement uses for these systems um, to track arrests. Um, I've highlighted some of these in orange to really talk about uh, the building capabilities that start to be possible with these new systems. Uh, things like crime trend analysis, uh, thinking about criminal associates where we start to get the idea of um, 
uh, uh, sort of drag nets, criminal drag nets uh, that are ha happening where we find someone who has a history of crime and then we go find folks that are associated with that person and then somehow bring them into uh, the criminal justice system simply by association and not necessarily by uh, particular um, actions. Um, and then you can see over here in this third co column, one of the more important things around simulation and modeling and then what we get into in terms of capabilities around predictive policing uh, and uh, profiling, profiling uh, by race, pro profiling by uh, neighborhood characteristics, geography, all of the things that come into play. Again, all of this is and has started to proliferate across the country in massive uh, ways and systems uh, by 1970. Um, by the time you get to the end of the 70s, uh, there are hundreds of these uh, and they continue to grow and grow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. There's so much to say and I've skipped over um, so much, but I wanna be able to have some discussion so that you're able to sort of fill in some of the, the blanks. Uh, but what I wanted to really sort of point out is again, how might we say a technology becomes racist. And why do I find it so easy and matter of fact to say, yes, technology can be racist and that technology, uh, at least in this respect, in this sector, where we talk about law enforcement technology is racist. And I think that one of the things I wanted to sort of show, albeit um, uh, not in a very detailed uh, or, or perhaps even effective way here, is the way in which structure, systems, et cetera, work together uh, to build this edifice that then has disparate outcomes along racial lines. And I thought I would sort of leave aside uh, the outcomes because at least in the world that I sit, those seem so um, uh, glaring and visible in terms of the devastation uh, that law enforcement enforcement uh, and computational law enforcement, I will put it that way, has um, devastated and impacted communities of color, uh, African-American um, uh, communities uh, in particular. And when we look today at the many different forms of uh, law enforcement technologies from predictive policing, things like CompStat and command and control systems, uh, that are part of a growing number of police forces across the country, saturation uh, patrolling, racial profiling, facial recognition, all of these things that we know have had uh, disparate and devastating consequences on communities of color, all have a very specific um, linear footprint uh, towards uh, and to that um, origin story and origin moments back in 1965 and 68. And so when I talk about um, technology as being racist, this is an example of what I am talking about. And then if we were to have a discussion about what does anti-racist technology look like, um, for me, that means in some part, thinking about what it would take to undo something of what we have just seen over the last few minutes, uh, and whether that is a complete undoing of the structure and system or the replacement of new technologies uh, in various aspects of this structure that would have uh, more positive consequences on other areas of uh, the system. Um, and so there's a lot uh, there, and I think uh, at this point I'll just uh, with talking uh, because there's so much more to say and I've talked too long and then you have questions and I'm very happy to hear them. So thank you for your attention uh, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you Charlton. Excellent. So we have uh, a number of questions that we've started to get through the submission system. I will try to, I will be the Greek chorus here. Panelists, says, uh, as usual, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourselves and just go ahead and ask the questions directly. Charlton, the panelists are uh, PhD students and faculty here. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and then we'll hand it off to the panelists. 
Uh, so we have a question wondering how your own personal perceptions around racism and technology have changed due to the pandemic. Um, has it given you any sort of new perspectives or is it sort of reinforcing what you what you were already thinking? You know, what have been your, your reactions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it has reinforced um, my thinking. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, it, it could only be that way having come from just uh, writing and putting out this book. And so in a lot of ways, the pandemic sort of magnified um, uh, much of the current of what it is that I was already thinking, particularly as we, you know, started to look at, you know, of course, the rush of uh, sort of technological solutions at the beginning of the pandemic, right, uh, from various forms of hardware uh, to software that would, uh, uh, was sort of developing to do everything from protect folks from the virus and so ventilators and so forth uh, to software to help track uh, transmissions and so forth um, and varieties of uh, you know AI or machine learning uh, that was developed in the service of that and you know and I recall in the moment where you know we had that sort of massive realization about uh, what communities were being, disparately impact by the virus itself, uh, but also who um, and in what communities were the proliferation of these new technologies, particularly those that were so problematic in terms of privacy and invasiveness and tracking who those were focused on. Um, and so many folks, of course, uh, you know, this was some surprise in some way for me, it was really, you know, and uh, a different um, sort of manifestation of uh, what I would already see and uh, say. And that's, I'll sum up in sort of this way, which is, you know, we often talk about race and technology or racism and technology and thinking about anti-racism in terms of technological solutions. Um, and for me, in large part, our solutions uh, aren't so much technological uh, because the problems are really around race um, deeply, um, even before the technology. And so this racial structure of inequity was already in place uh, when the pandemic hits. And so it was natural and expected for someone like me to see the kinds of ways in which that uh, played out. Thanks, Charlton. Uh, over to the panelists. Yeah, if I might jump in. Thank you so much, Charlton. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the group. I do work on marginalized people's experiences and representation in socio-technical systems. And so I was really excited to hear this work and I'm really excited for the book. Uh, the thing that I wanted to ask you was kind of similarly along the lines you were just touching on, to what extent do you think the, uh, the racism that has resulted from these systems or the racism that they contribute to is you know due to the technology and like is there such a thing as like better technology that would help avoid those outcomes or is it really that you know the structure of policing and law enforcement was from its inception racist and therefore any technology that was sort of aiding towards that end was going to end up kind of following in those kinds of footsteps and maybe exacerbating or continuing those problems so is it possible even really to, to separate those two do you think that the the issues kind of stem from the fundamental structure of law enforcement and policing, uh, you know, and to what, are, what degree is the technology kind of adding or, or doing more on top of that? Yeah, great question. And I, I you know, I lean towards the latter, right? And it's, um, it's the, the reason I define um, sort of racism and uh, sort of racist tech in the way that I do, which is when you have a structure and system that is already targeted and built an infrastructure to do certain things, um, then any new thing tends to go in the service of that ideal, regardless of sort of the intent of the new thing, right? And so this is why I think there's so much of um, inertia and why things don't change, because of course you have technologists who, you know, who don't want to do those things and are building new systems, but then what else is going to happen when you build a law enforcement technology that comes with it already a sense of what the imperative is what its use is where it needs to be deployed who is going to even support the infrastructure for its development and 
uh, proliferation. And all of those things exist before the, the sort of technological um, new. And so, uh, so I, I, that's very much how I think about things. It's, um, you know, it tends towards the pessimistic side, which I have to admit, I, I stay in most of the time. Um, when we get to the question about how do we undo, and part of why I've started to talk a lot about anti-racist technology is really to guard against the idea that this could be simple and simplified in the ways that we've talked about, let's say, um, you know, uh, uh, ameliorating bias in technological systems where, you know, the thought is if we could just make a better system, better algorithm, better inputs, better data, things will be better. And I think probably not. Uh, and so a much more wholesale change of system, but, you know, to the optimistic side, I do think is possible. And part of the reason why I like talking about this kind of origin story is to show that these things have beginnings, right? And if the current infrastructure had a beginning, it also means something different could have a beginning. Absolutely, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. I'll pop to a question from uh, someone who's, in a, who's a student or an attendee asking, how do we integrate communities of color into the design process to ensure that the tech is anti-racist without asking them to do a ton of labor? That's a great question. And I think, um, I think the reality, the short answer is we can't. Um, it is labor on both parts. And so I don't think that we should think about how do we not um, uh, sort of get away or ask folks to do that labor. I think it's about how do we make sure that that labor is uh, rewarded and valued and really accrues value to those um, communities. And so, uh, you know, I think the large part of the story that I didn't tell here had a lot to do with um, not so much who was involved, but who wasn't. Um, and I think that's part of what this question goes to. That is, um, if Black communities had been part of, in 1965 and 68, uh, this, let's think about what solutions could be and what could we and how could we marshal uh, this new computing capability to, um, uh, to help think about these, the, the problems of, of that day. I think we may have had quite different outcomes, but in 1965, we didn't have the inclination to do so, nor um, uh, the, the structure to do so. Now, today, when we uh, do have the inclination, which I think is a great step forward, I think we find ourselves without a structure that enables us to do so and do so um, at a scale uh, that is meaningful. So. So I, I don't have a question or an answer to this question because I think um, we have yet to really grapple with it. I think we recognize that it is a problem, but we need scaffolding. We need an infrastructure that says, here are groups of um, technologists or varying uh, groups of people that are uh, embedded in a community um, who is a position to think about the knowledge that comes from those communities as being valuable um, to give time to uh, engender trust in that community uh, to make sure that there is not just sort of this extraction uh, going on, but uh, that there is uh, value um, accruing uh, to that. And I, we simply don't have the structures to enable that. We don't have that structure in the university. We don't have that structure um, uh, uh, very well in government that helps to do so. So that is one thing that I think we have to um, we have to build. And again, I think that was something that was crystal clear um, and sort of magnified in COVID, where folks saw um, communities that were being um, disserved and disadvantaged, um, and yet no real way to move at a deliberate speed take into account who those communities were and what it is that their needs and privileges um, or um, priorities were and our varying technological systems or other systems for helping to ameliorate problems. So I think 
uh, you know, a particularly great work to be done to figure out how to build an infrastructure for this to, uh, to happen. I'm wondering uh, really quickly, because you focused a lot on, on structural change being necessary to deal with a lot of these problems. What can individual technologists do and sort of what, what do we gain by giving individual technologists more understanding of where their own work falls in this sort of history? Yeah, thank you for that question, because, you know, oftentimes um, sort of my pessimism or the focus on the enormity of structure has that effect of sort of, you know, paralyzing folks, right? Um, all right, this thing seems to be so giant. So what can I as an individual technologist really do that will will matter? Uh, and I think there is a lot to be done. I think that I think what it does is to help give individual technologists a sense of what what could be and what should be. And so really to think about their um, you know, individual designs or what they're imagining um, in a much greater scope and scale because of uh, the sort of the necessity of what needs to be there. So if anything, I think it's trying to open up for technologists a a way to think about, all right, here is something, a technological application that I want to build that may have limited utility or might be focused particularly in one small sector um, of, um, you know, one of your colleagues I talked to earlier who was working on uh, building collaboration systems. So maybe I build something that helps us collaborate better and to do so in a much more inclusive way and perhaps even build something that helps uh, communicate uh, uh, communities of color or other concerns collaborate in that um, process of building some of these new um, technologies. Um, so to be able to take something from there and for someone to say, all right, I can have this limited application and I can sell it as an app or something like that and some people will use it and it will have some limited impact. Um, but what could it be if I have in mind over here a whole system that I know a little bit about? Um, does this one little thing that I've built um, have a point of connection with another technology in a different area? Or um, if I uh, sort of connected this technology with another in a particular area, um, could that give greater um, impact? And so, so trying to help folks get a sense of what that broader system is, in part to get a sense of what scaling looks like uh, and what uh, impact could look like for folks that are trying to build and are really thoughtfully building uh, from an anti-racist perspective. Um, and I guess part of what I'm trying to push against is this sort of like, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, which is quite fine, uh, but often those th thousand flowers don't work in concert with each other. And so at the end of the day, uh, their impact is gone and we, you know, we smell them for a few minutes and then it goes away. Um, and we don't really get the value, the full value of that. And so I think understanding this history, understanding the architecture of uh, racialized systems can help technologies think about uh, technologists think about what they're designing and building um, in terms of how it might be uh, more impactful. Thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will note that there were a number of other questions. There was Certainly a um, question that I saw several various versions of, you know, we continue to be allies at the societal level, wondering about what to do as individual technologists. Certainly a thing that uh, I think a number of folks in the, in the group have been, have been wrestling with. So thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Now your Friday evening. Uh, have a wonderful and restful weekend. And I think we will end it here.